Last week's episode was difficult to do, and this eight week's episode's even harder. I must not be being kind to myself. Welcome to the Principles of Success, Interviewing the Experts. And today's book review is Economics in One Lesson. Also, a super important book to read, especially when it comes to finance, because if you don't know how economic policies affect your ability to create wealth, then you're going to support economic policies that are most likely going to end up harming you in the long run. The basic premise of this book is a good economic policy or a bad economic policy is brought to about uh, by greed and or short-sightedness. The art of economics consists of not merely of consists of not merely looking at the immediate but at the long-term consequences and effects on groups. So if it affects group A positively but group B negatively, that's not necessarily good. And if it affects group A positively for a short term, but then affects them poorly in the long term, that's also not good. And I'm going to toss in a clip from the book itself real quick because it's a really powerful little section that I wanted to add. Now few people recognize the necessary implications of the economic statements they are constantly making. When they say that the way to economic salvation is to increase credit, it is just as if they said that the way to economic salvation is to increase debt. These are different names for the same thing, seen from opposite sides. When they say that the way to prosperity is to increase farm prices, it is like saying that the way to prosperity is to make food dearer for the city worker. When they say that the way to national wealth is to pay out governmental subsidies, they are in effect saying that the way to national wealth is to increase taxes. When they make it a main objective to increase exports, most of them do not realize that they necessarily make it a main objective ultimately to increase imports. When they say under nearly all conditions that the way to recovery is to increase wage rates, they have found only another way of saying that the way to recovery is to increase costs of production. It does not necessarily follow, because each of these propositions, like a coin, has its reverse side, or because the equivalent proposition, or the other name for the remedy, sounds much less attractive, that the original proposal is under all conditions unsound. There may be times when an increase in debt is a minor consideration as against the gains achieved with the borrowed funds, when a government subsidy is unavoidable to achieve a certain military purpose, when a given industry can afford an increase in production costs, and so on. But we ought to make sure in each case that both sides of the coin have been considered, that all the implications of a proposal have been studied, and this is seldom done. Most of this book is focused on denouncing economic fallacies. So the first fallacy on my list is the broken window fallacy. And essentially what this is, is somebody throws a brick through the window of a baker. Well, that baker then has to buy money or spend money for the window man to come and re repair it. The fallacy is believing that the if it wasn't for that broken window, then the window maker wouldn't have ever had to have replaced the window and therefore wouldn't have created economic income. And that sounds ludicrous, but you hear it all the time on just much larger scale. Like for instance, I'm sure most of you have heard that the Second World War got America out of the Great Depression. That is a perfect example of the broken window fallacy. Destruction bringing about profitability. What is always forgotten is the lost opportunities that came at that price. Sure, production got done and people made profit from it, but that baker, instead of buying a new window, might have bought a new suit with that same money. That tailor who then did the suit might have gone and done other stuff with that money. So just because party A, the window maker, benefited from that window being broken does not mean that breaking the window 
was a net positive for the society. The next fallacy is need is not the same as demand. A great example of this fallacy coming into play is the coronavirus and toilet paper. The demand for toilet paper skyrocketed, but not because the need drastically increased, but because certain individuals were panic buying and buying it all up. And because of the supply chain being interrupted, that caused more panic buying, which then fueled more and more. I know plenty of people who still have lots of toilet paper stocked up from panic buying. The need did not increase, but the demand temporarily increased. So when you make a policy that increases the demand without actually increasing the need, you create artificial booms and busts. I don't really know how to explain this one much more in depth than that, but it's something really important to understand, so go read the book. The next fallacy that is on my list is government paying for stuff. And what I wrote down is from the book, I believe this is a direct quote, and it is, every dollar government spends must eventually be paid for by taxes or by inflation. So yes, the government can buy stuff, but every dollar that the government has has come at the opportunity cost of businesses and individuals income that they had to take from those people to be able to pay for those things and for some of the stuff it's good for a lot of the stuff it's not where that line is drawn is up for political debate but one of the biggest fallacies especially when it comes to government spending is that government spending fuels the economy by creating jobs that otherwise wouldn't have been created examples of this are pointless government jobs that they create in order to increase employment without there being an actual demand and the biggest problem with doing that is every public job comes at the expense of a private job that money that the government got to have somebody fill in dirt which isn't an exaggeration came at the cost of somebody having a job doing something that was actually productive. And there are jobs that the government is suited for. For instance, military. Military is a perfect example of where government funding is appropriate. Anything beyond that is up for personal interpretation and political arguments. I'm not trying to be political, so we'll just move on. The next problem with this is you can see what was created, but you can't see what was not created due to the government taking the taxes. So for instance, you can point to Mount Rushmore and look at this beautiful mountain of carved stones. What you can't point to is the jobs and industries that could have been created instead. You can point to the Hoover Dam and look, we have power for all these people now. What you can't point to is the million of other companies that never existed due to the taxes that were needed to produce that. Taxes deter production, hiring, and working more, especially when you have a tax system like America, where once you get to a certain point, you start making less and less. It deters the same level of productivity past that point. The next fallacy is that government lending is good. Government lends to unprofitable people and lose your money because they don't need to worry about generating a profit. That's what taxes are for. So when government gets involved in lending people money, then Generally, that money is more likely to be lost in unprofitable ventures and be eliminated from the marketplace. And I know he talked about alternatives that help in that, but I don't remember them. I read this book a couple of weeks ago at this point, or reread this book a couple of weeks ago at this point, so I've already forgotten a bunch of stuff. That's one of the important things about reading and studying is you got to remember that you will forget a majority of the stuff that you absorb and unless you can unless you 
really hone in on what you're studying, you will lose almost all of it. So go back, re-listen, re-watch, re-read, re-study over and over and over again until you've got it. And for less complex topics, it's a lot easier to seem like you know what you're talking about than like last week talking about statistics, this week talking about economics. I think you can tell that I'm not as confident in my speech with these more complex topics because I am not an expert on these. I just know some of the best books on these topics for people who are not experts to get a grasp of them. So the next fallacy is automation and losing jobs. Throughout human history, any innovation always has people worrying about the jobs that are going to be lost by this new innovation to the point that nowadays people are talking about policies for the to prepare for the inevitable of nobody being able to work because the machines took all the jobs i'm pretty sure you've all heard stuff like that before problem is there is no evidence that this has ever been true what you lose jobs in one industry but then it, additional jobs are created for the best example of this is throughout history, almost everyone was a farmer because you needed the majority of the population to be farmers in order to feed the few who weren't. But as we evolve technologically, less and less people have had to become farmers and industries that had never even been thought of to exist, like rocket science, were created, or like restaurants, were created because more, more production was produced with less effort and therefore freed up time for individuals to create new fields and new th ways to produce. For instance, podcasts. Podcasts really did not exist because there was not enough technology available to do it for the masses to be able to do it individually. So that's the next fallacy he talks about that I wrote down. I skipped a bunch, these are just some of my favorites. So that's also an important fallacy to know that automation does not decrease jobs. It might temporarily displace jobs, but it does not decrease the overall jobs. John Smith is still affected, but James can now operate the machines that replace John Smith, and John Smith can go do other work. It is also important to remember, it still affects the people. The people losing the jobs are real people. They're still losing the jobs. So it's important that you don't try and stop progress, but you also make it possible for people to adapt. That's why listening to podcasts like this is so important. So that way you can adapt when change comes and you can take the principles that you learned and apply them to whatever you do. The next one I wrote down are unions are inefficient. I don't remember the arguments well enough to feel comfortable putting it out on the podcast. So I'm going to skip that one and go to the, the fallacy of the 30 hour work week would be that mandating that a 30 hour work week is full time would be more beneficial to the individuals and the economy. And he broke down two ways of doing this. Either you decrease the hours but increase the wages so that way you still make the same amount with less hours or you decrease the hours but don't increase the wages which then forces people to adjust and it comes from the fallacy that money is a finite resource that people creating wealth does not work infinitely so policies like this are trying to spread the pie around as much as possible and like well you're already doing fine so why don't you we let somebody who's doing less fortunate than you get a piece of your pie and that's where policies like this come from but it is important to remember that as you invest into the into the pie into productive people that the pie grows the next fallacy he talks about is 100 percent employment isn't necessarily a good thing and he uses the example of plenty of starving people in Africa or plenty of countries in Africa with starving individuals have 100% employment. Their employment is just menial tasks that are barely productive enough to keep them alive, like walking eight miles to 
get water and walk back. So when the focus is on employment and not on profitability and production, you end up creating policies that don't necessarily create the most production. They just make it so that the most people are employed, which goes back to that fallacy of trying to spread the pie around the finite pie around as much as possible. Next, he talks about tariffs. Tariffs from an economic standpoint are not good. There's zero reason for tariffs in an economic standpoint. However, he points out, and it's important to remember that sometimes tariffs are needed in order to level the playing field against other countries. A perfect example of this is American tariffs on Chinese steel. If you let the American steel industry die due to Chinese steel industry, then in times of war, the American steel industry is dead. And if America is at war with China, with China then the they have no way of producing and acquiring steel. So from purely economic standpoint, there's no reason for tariffs, but for plenty of other reasons, there's t an important role that tariffs play, especially when back to that example, China, the government subsidizes the Chinese steel industry. So by putting a tariff on it, it levels out the playing field with the steel industry of China that's already been subsidized. Which goes to the next fallacy and that subsidies are good. What a subsidy does is it basically makes a unprofitable industry more profitable at the cost because remember, every dollar that the government spends comes at the cost of a different of individuals that the money was taken from. So it makes one industry more profitable at the cost of another industry. And again, there is a role for national security reasons and other reasons like that where subsidies can play a role. But generally, subsidies are there to buy votes. Next one he talks about is rent control leads to housing collapse. And the short version of this is when you put a cap on rent in a particular area, let's just say you make it so the, this building, you can't have rent above $1,000. Well, as costs and maintenance and all of that stuff goes up, that cap stays in place until eventually it is no longer profitable for the landlord to have this building and maintain it. So then it slowly starts to fall apart, which then makes people less likely to want to stay in there. And it's just a downward cycle until a lot of times in places where there is a rent cap, landlords will just abandon the buildings and new buildings won't be built because of the rent cap because it is not profitable for them to build a new building and then with the rent cap lose money every month because they can't generate enough money to pay for the new building. And the tariffs, the subsidies, and the rent controls are all basically government, top-down government trying to control the price of sales. And the problem with that is it doesn't work. That, that's the problem is it doesn't work it creates many more problems than it solves. Some of the problems that we deal with today are from policies of doing that. And that includes falling wages, the middle class shrinking, unemployment, minimum wages. All of those are price controls that the government has tried to implement and has caused many more problems. The last thing I wanna talk about is the importance of profit. The stereotype of the evil businessman is abundant, especially in our culture for some reason. And for some reason, people always think that businesses are jacking up prices to make profits. But the truth of the matter is that whoever has the ability to do it more efficiently and cheaper is the one who wins. You can't raise your prices artificially because your competition will undercut those prices and you'll go out of business. So whenever a business starts making profit, it's because they have figured out a way to do it faster and better than their competition, not because they raise their prices. So the profit is the reward for knowing how to do things better. And because the unprofitable businesses go out of business, 
we slowly get better and better at creating and producing and all of that over time. And whoever gets to be the best at it is the one who wins. And when somebody gets better at it than them, that's the one who wins. So profit is important because it fuels the creativity of innovation, along with other reasons, but that's the biggest reason for it. I hope you got some value out of my rambling and from that clip, and I will see you all next week.